Sorry, Phil. We have to disqualify you for talking with your mouth full. Bad manners. Now that we're getting into the show proper, it's worth talking about its actual structure. Word Girl episodes are, usually, 11 minutes long and come grouped in pairs that air together. Since PBS doesn't air commercials the same way as other channels, we don't just get random advertisements between paired episodes. Instead, we get specially made interstitials to break them up or fill time before transitioning into the credits. These interstitials have come in different forms and varieties over the show's life, but in Season 1, we get four kinds that show up with each episode pair. There's vocabulary segments where Huggy acts out a word before dancing, and where random kids are asked what their favorite words are. I'd say the latter is better because there's more variety to it, and I like how the kids' actors are good at impersonating, or maybe even are, actual kids with the occasional pauses and tangents. It feels more genuine and helps with the live interview feel they aim for. There's also a short clip where kids are encouraged to visit their local libraries, but this is just the same narration played over the same random clips each time. Nice message, but nothing interesting to say. The big one, though, would be May I Have a Word, a game show segment where host Bo Handsome challenges three kid contestants, Phil, Tommy, and Emily, to define words based on Word Girl clips to win goofy prizes that are apparently all Word Girl branded? This is the best of the interstitials due to the greater variety, humor, and character. Bo is appropriately showman-like, and we get to see the contestants' personalities over time. It's just so cute the way Huggy pounces on people. Okay. Uh, what he said? Well, that... It technically is correct! Aw oh, man, that's lamer than the paperclip. Indeed it is! I'm not going to be discussing every May I Have a Word segment like I am the proper episodes, cause, well, there's not really any story to discuss. I will, however, single out any specific clips that I find are particularly funny or interesting. But enough about game show hosts, for now. It's time to get into the first actual episode of the series. <sighs> I just said we were done with game shows. Toby's mom leaves on a business trip, leaving Toby in the care of a babysitter who I'm guessing isn't from this town. Toby sneaks out by using a hologram and performs random havoc with his robots. Wurgle and Huggy try to stop him, but find themselves overwhelmed by the amount of robots and calling the babysitter does no good either. Huggy is sent to talk to the babysitter personally, while Word Girl herself tries to stall Toby, which eventually leads to... a vocabulary game show. It makes sense in context, I swear. Word Girl wins the game show, Toby tries to destroy the city anyway, and Huggy shows up with an emergency device to shut down the robots. Toby is promptly confronted with an angry mother and a similarly angry babysitter. This is a decently strong start to the first season. It starts off pretty standard and predictable, but in a pretty entertaining way. There's a lot of good timing here, comedic and otherwise, with my favorite example being Huggy sharing his realistic expectations of his own abilities. Huggy. The game show angle seems like an odd turn, but aside from it referencing the original Toby shorts, I don't want to focus too much on continuity and references here, it's just the right kind of goofiness that sticks out more than just fighting giant robots all day long, and it was actually set up decently well by Word Girl and Toby training synonyms for a bit after Huggy leaves. I also like how it both provides a more justified reason to include definitions, and does them more creatively when the final round is, once again, a series of synonyms. And the icing on the cake is the narrator being unabashedly biased towards Word Girl, to the point where I almost want to view Toby cheating as him leveling the playing field. I like how Toby is specifically shown to be playing games with his robots. It feels more like he's a bored kid with too many resources than in other appearances where he just wants to commit generic destruction in order to get attention from his crush. Speaking of the crush, this episode plays it up a bit more than the shorts, and it's amusing to see him stammer through the episode, particularly in how he's apparently trying to keep his crush secret and failing miserably. That said, there's a couple moments that come off as less amusing and more... creepy, frankly. I'm going to prove that I'm smarter than you, and then you'll be mine! All mine! What do you mean by I'll be all yours? Toby's crush tends to flip-flop between being depicted as a Batman-Catwoman thing and a sanitized version of Frollo's feelings for Esmeralda, depending on the episode. I've said before that I'm not a Tobeki fan due to how much the fandom overrates it, but the way individual episodes depict Toby can make my opinion fluctuate from that's cute, I guess, to I don't want to see how he'd behave when he gets older. Another bit of weirdness in the episode is the giant flower that menaces Becky's house. Yeah, that happens, and the only reason I didn't mention it in the plot summary is because the flower gets stomped by a robot after 10 seconds. My opinion on this beat was mixed at first, but it's grown on me. While it is a bit random even for this show, the flower getting stomped is funny, and it helps set up the featured word enormous. It also leads into this great joke. Oh, thank you. 
Maybe my favorite joke, though, is Huggy destroying the inactive robots at the end of the episode. This never even occurred to me as a kid, but I love how Huggy is taking the opportunity to look cool and or work off some steam after putting up a miserable showing while the robots were turned on. In my mind, the primary task of a first episode is to let viewers know what to expect from a series, and as someone who's never heard of Word Girl got to see... No, that's 54. No, that's 113. No, that... Just go talk to the babysitter. And... I'm not allowed to say... But you revealed mine! Yeah, but it's her show. They'd realize what they're getting into. You too, Huggy. Join us again next time for the amazing colossal adventures of Word Girl! I, I understood that reference. What do you need hobbies for? You're a vegan, not a man. After Scoops talks to Becky and Bob about his dreams of being a big shot reporter and his efforts on their elementary school paper, The Daily Rag, we see a mysterious man inviting the employees and customers at a bank to a free barbecue, only to rob the bank while they're distracted. Later, Word Girl interrupts a similar robbery at the jewelry store, of course executed by the butcher. The butcher gets away, but Word Girl realizes that he's planning his crimes based on Scoops' stories in The Daily Rag. Word Girl and Scoops use this to lure the butcher to a vegetarian restaurant where they use the power of tofu to defeat him. Huggy, I think tofu blocks the butcher's power! Yeah, that makes sense. Normally I tend to prioritize the villains in my discussions because they drive the plot and tend to have the most bombastic and enjoyable personalities, but I'd actually say Scoops is the big highlight here. This episode was clearly meant to set up a lot about him, whether it be character beats or running gags. News reporting is clearly his one true love, sad for Becky, and we get to learn a specific goal tied to it. Learn Word Girl's secret identity. What do you mean you're not sure? That I'm not sure. What's your secret identity? Nice try. Ah. We also get to see how he can be a bit tactless in how he writes about others, and has a little bit of an ego, giving himself the bulk of the credit for the Butcher's downfall, fleshing him out a bit more than just intrepid kid reporter. Scoops is a fun character, and you can get a bit of a sense for why Becky has a crush on him aside from just finding him cute, admiring his ambition and determination. He's always first on the scene and is not afraid to get involved. But getting back to the Butcher, I was surprised by how much more insight on him this episode gives than I remembered. His diversion barbecue plan may seem ridiculous, but shows him coming up with more intelligent plans than just We also get to see him learn what a vegetarian is. For the second time. Hey, did you know these people here don't eat meat? Yes, that's what vegetarian means. That's sick. Aside from the character beats, there's not much to say here. Most of the episode is in the sort of weird limbo state, where it stays consistently entertaining, but not spectacularly so, and there are very few moments that stick out. Probably my favorite parts were everything having to do with the butcher and tofu. Though conversely, the customers playing into the hippie vegetarian stereotype was kinda tiring. Well, there is one odd thing. The episode doesn't seem to handle time well. We transition from the bank to the jewelry store with a meanwhile narration, but it's then implied and later stated that it's actually the next day. We also don't get a sense of time progression into the scene where the butcher gets the paper luring him to the vegetarian restaurant, although at least there's not any actual temporal inconsistencies here. It's not a big deal, but it can be pretty distracting and disorienting when you notice it. I apologize to however many people will forever be distracted and disoriented while rewatching this episode in the future. The expression is, you can't fight City Hall. Oh, whatever. A bake sale at City Hall is interrupted by Chuck the Evil Sandwich Guy showing up with the machine to crush the building if his demands are not met. Word Girl tries to stop the crusher, but quickly realizes the only way to do so is to deactivate it with Chuck's password. She distracts Chuck by encouraging him to think about the demands he never actually thought up, while she goes through the password and Huggy enlists Mrs. Botsford's help to find a clue in Chuck's file. Chuck threatens to skip right to the crushing when he realizes Word Girl was tricking him, but Huggy and Sally show up with the password and the day is saved. Remember how last time I said I had some insight on Chuck I'd save for here? Well, I couldn't help but notice that despite his awkward and easygoing demeanor, Chuck is actually one of the more destructive villains in the cast, using massive machines to wreck stuff so he can get his way. Toby is similar in this regard, but at least you could argue he's just an immature kid. Chuck is a grown adult, yet still goes for property damage and spiteful petty revenge, more on that later, surprisingly often. Heck, in this very episode, he spends half of it brainstorming huge demands worthy of his threat, but when he finally decides to ask for $10 million, he takes back his demands and decides to destroy City Hall anyway, just because Word Girl lied to him about not trying to stop the Crusher. However, it does take some time and thinking to notice these aspects since Chuck's characterization does still emphasize his awkwardness, and this episode is no exception. We see him embarrass himself by accidentally leaving the intercom on, ask how Word Girl found him only to realize he wasn't hiding, and fail to actually come up with demands initially because he wasn't expecting to have to make them. To be honest, you've usually stopped me by this point. I don't know. 
I never thought I'd get this far. Aside from Chuck, this is the first episode that gives significant focus to Becky's mom. The Toby Shorts established that she worked at the district attorney's office, but this is the first time it's relevant to the plot, as Huggy needs her help to find a file on Chuck that could hold a clue to his password. We also get to see more of her skewed priorities, focusing on showing Huggy around her office over the giant crusher, and her apparent fear of giant destructive things. Crusher! Or maybe I'll just go get into my word girl costume. Though admittedly, these two aspects contradict each other a bit. Maybe her fear is tied to object permanence and she's not paralyzed if she can't see the thing? Overall, despite my overthinking, this is a pretty funny episode. Most of the best jokes revolve around Chuck, like word girl being able to guess the first password correctly on her first try. Mustard? Okay, not anymore! But there's also stuff like Word Girl doing the Mambo to cover up that she accidentally said Mom, get used to this sort of gag, and the narrator's sarcastic description of Word Girl and Huggy's exploits. And so City Hall is saved from doom by the swift thinking and explosive kung fu of Word Girl and Captain Huggy Face. As much as I mostly liked the original Chuck shorts, I'd say this was a stronger opening for the character for how it showed off his personality and possibly accidental deeper aspects, with other characters getting a bit more of a chance to shine as well. Tune in next time for another thrill-packed episode of Word Girl. I'll give you this, I'll give you this one for free. Google the word coincidence. Warden Chalmers unveils a new security measure for the city's prison. Literally just a giant maze. Dr. Two Brains is used for the test run, but his henchmen are able to lead him out with smelly cheese. Two Brains and his henchmen rob a museum later and are briefly defeated until a light fixture coincidentally falls and provides a cover for them to escape. Two Brains bickers with his henchmen over the designs of the new uniforms they asked for, and Word Girl and Huggy try and fail to thwart a series of crimes until finding his hideout, which they've already been to, a very specific kind of dirt that can only be found in two places in the world, the African Congo and right on our city's waterfront. The henchmen are easily subdued and Two Brains is defeated by, what else, a light fixture coincidentally falling on him. This is an episode that gets away with a lot of nonsense thanks to the show's educational facet. A part of me wants to call the episode annoyingly stupid and contrived, but it's very blatantly something done on purpose to demonstrate the featured word coincidence, so it's hard to actually get upset at it. It actually manages to be self-aware and funny about it, honestly. Some other funny bits come from Word Girl and Two Brains' casual conversations. Their relationship seems to have retained some of the friendliness they had from before Box Lightning's transformation. They're willing to just stop in the middle of a confrontation and have a lighthearted talk that can divert into posturing and fighting at any moment. The henchmen also get to be a step up from the shorts. We learn that while they will apparently work for other villains while Two Brains is in jail, they seem to be particularly loyal to Two Brains for... some reason but they're also willing to lodge some complaints and requests. It's easy to write criminal henchmen as just generic greedy or violent thugs, but Charlie and the one who doesn't have a name get a surprising amount of focus and development in this episode and over the show, and one of them doesn't even speak. It's also just fun to see Dr. Two Brains, the cheese-obsessed mad scientist, trying to be a good boss and balance his employees' wishes with his own resources and goals. Some other humor highlights would be Charlie putting a clothespin on his nose for a reason that isn't immediately made clear, the prison maze immediately being torn down when Two Brains escapes, Word Girl realizing her crime fighting has gone past her bedtime, and the montage of Dr. Two Brains' cheese crimes. The latter keeps the pace just right and gives us a lot of goofy visuals without needing to rely on dialogue at all. This episode also has some surprisingly good art in a few places. I don't think the show's art style and animation as a whole are that impressive, more on that in a later video, but this episode gives us a uniquely exaggerated face when Becky yells at a sleeping Bob, Huggy silently sneaking off while Word Girl explains the dirt, and a neat bit of composition where a headshot of Word Girl is overtaken by a flash of light which fades into two brains holding his stolen cheese. It's nice when they put a little extra effort into making the show visually interesting. This episode maybe isn't the best reintroduction to Dr. Two Brains, but it sets up more about him we didn't see in the shorts, and is willing to let its featured words influence the plot progression in a way that would be annoying anywhere else, but works out here. The most efficient mode of transportation in order to elude Superman, a blimp. It's free! It's free! It's free! Okay, this is the second episode where the bank gives people toasters. I remember this from Spider-Man 2 as well, was this ever actually a thing? Anyway, while Becky and her family are doing some grocery shopping, Granny Mae is out using fake coupons and her standard helpless old lady shtick to get money, and a toaster, from the bank and every car from a used car lot. When her tactics don't work on the grocery store manager, she decides to just tie him up, allowing Becky to witness this and intervene as word girl. Granny Mae escapes and tries a coupon at the jewelry store, and things play out about the same until Huggy hitches a ride on her suit of armor as she flies off. Granny Mae prepares to print a coupon that would make her ruler of the city, but Huggy manages to delay her until Word Girl shows up, at which point the two work together to destroy the coupon printing machine and apprehend Granny Mae. 
Granny Mae is one of the villains who relies on lies and manipulation the most, so she makes sense for a plot about fake coupons. I'm still not the biggest fan of her fake mishearing running gag, but I do appreciate how it serves in active use, using it to pretend someone said something bad to turn others against them and get them flustered enough to play along with Granny Mae's demands. Speaking of Granny's demands, when the plot reaches her house, she starts scolding Huggy and Word Girl for dirtying up the place, which hits a boiling point when she gets more angry about Huggy ruining her couch than the two getting her arrested. She also does my favorite iteration of the people mistaking Huggy for the wrong animal gag thus far. It's only a single person who uses the same wrong animal every time, making it feel more consistent and coherent, and it leads to a funny payoff where Huggy uses another one of his communication cards to insist he's a monkey and not a rat. Granny Mae is just overall a lot funnier and more endearing here than in the shorts. There's not really much to say with other characters. We get some random bit parts just there to be robbed by Granny. My favorite were the used car guys. Expires December 32nd. Looks real to me. Let's go to lunch. Sally and TJ are also there, but don't really do anything that noteworthy. Reginald gets to be the one victim who recognizes Granny Mae as a criminal and even gets to be a little smug and snarky about it, and the narrator gets a funny moment after we cut to Granny Mae's house. But she seems to have an unexpected visitor in the rafters. Sorry. Word Girl is shown having no patience for Granny Mae's nonsense, while Huggy is allowed a bit of solo focus for a brief time, something I hope we get to see more of later on. The one thing I wish the episode would have done was have Granny Mae actually print the Take Over the City coupon and try to redeem it. While it would have sacrificed the use of Granny's house as a set, it would have made the climax even more suspenseful and chaotic. The climax we did get was pulled off pretty well, though. Evidently, you're a wanted thief. Where's the hunted beef? How did I know where it is? I have to assume in a show where the butcher is a character, we eventually do get an episode involving haunted beef. When life gives you lemons, don't make lemonade. Make life take the lemons back. Get mad! Word Girl and Huggy finish setting up their superhero hideout in the spaceship they crash on Earth. They're then called to intercept a robbery, but arrive too late to catch the culprit. Word Girl suspects it's Dr. Two Brains, but realizes it can't be him because he's supposedly still in prison and wouldn't steal gold anyway. We then see a mysterious man use a machine to transform gold bars into potato salad, which upsets him. Word Girl verifies with Warden Chalmers that Two Brains is still locked up before going to stop his henchmen from stealing more gold, but they get away. Word Girl visits Two Brains in prison only to discover it's a mannequin made of soap, and we see Two Brains using two rays to transform gold from potato salad and then into cheese. Two Brains moves to steal an ancient artifact to transform next, but is intercepted by an apparently solo Word Girl. Word Girl is captured, but Huggy turns out to have been hiding in the artifact and tricks the villain into potato salading the second ray before Two Brains is restrained by being forced to instinctually run on a giant mouse wheel. This episode screams this was supposed to be the first Two Brains episode of the main series. It re-explains his backstory and keeps his presence vague and mysterious like the Butcher in High Fat Robbery, even to the point of trying to set up a big mystery about whether it's actually him or not. I also feel like Two Brains' new ability to chew through walls, which is talked about as if it's been a thing for a long time, makes more sense before Two Brain Highway because why didn't he just use it then instead of waiting for the maze? If this episode came first, you could just argue that the prison came up with some way to stop his chewing ability. Then again, I have no memory of this ability ever being used again, so take that as you will. I have to assume this episode just got shuffled around for whatever reason because it feels very weird to put this before Two Brain Highway. I'd also argue it's a better reintroduction to the henchmen. Much like in Two Brain Highway, they ask Two Brains to change how things run, but now have the even bigger issue of payment. Apparently, Dr. Two Brains only paid them in cheese before, and they want to keep some of the gold to make rent. I feel like someone in this world needs to set up a supervillain henchman union at some point. Two Brains is against this, but not for the reason you might expect. Then people would think I'm just some ordinary run-of-the-mill criminal, you know, boring. I'm honestly starting to think the Box Lightner personality has come to enjoy crime, and that's why the Jekyll Hyde dynamic fell off so suddenly. We also get a funny and admittedly endearing moment where the henchmen are surprised and happy that Word Girl remembers them and not just their boss. These guys make Two Brains episodes way more enjoyable than if it was just a doc on his own, and he's already a strong enough character that he could carry an episode solo if he needed. Just look at his plan here. He wants to turn gold into cheese, but can only transform it into potato salad. His solution? Use some of the gold to make a second ray specifically for turning potato salad into cheese. Word Girl herself points out three different plans that would be less convoluted, but Two Brains just argues he was in a rut. This is the start of a running gag of convoluted Two Brains plans that culminates amazingly near the end of the season. Aside from Word Girl, Huggy, Two Brains, and the Henchmen though, the cast of the episode is actually smaller than usual. We got more Warden Chalmers, who also gets to kick off a running gag. For some people I'll leave my hat as an expression, not with me. Right. I have to go. 
I'm gonna eat the hat. And a random security guard at the bank, but that's literally all the characters we get. While I'd like to say that I like focusing in on the important characters, the episode unfortunately feels a bit more flat without the multiple different personalities and voices other episodes would give us. It's like a bottle episode on accident, and I'm not sure you could write a great bottle episode unless you're aware you're writing one. I say all that, but the episode does still manage to be funny and well made. There's some clever bits like a silhouette of Word Girl hiding in wait at the museum, blending in with the statues, Word Girl excusing Huggy's absence by saying he slipped on some soap after he was handling the fake soap Two Brains at the prison, or just a simple but effective plan of have Huggy ambush Two Brains by hiding inside the artifact. This episode also introduces the spaceship hideout, which is a spaceship hideout where Word Girl and Huggy can hang out and plan their next move sometimes. Not much to say about it here. Ultimately, while I think this episode has some oddities that could have been done differently, it's a decent showing overall. It certainly didn't leave me glum at all. No, I'm sorry, Emily. Puggy, show Emily what she could have won. That's great, because I'm allergic to bubbles. That is great. I now realize that he's a great... Big jerk! Bob shows off some massive glasses he hopes to use as an additional disguise, and we learn he and Becky will be going to the museum, where artifacts from Tryptophania, love that pun, are on display. Meanwhile, the Butcher laments his inability to beat Word Girl until he learns about one of the aforementioned artifacts, the Beef Jerky of Supreme Power. Later, as Bob struggles to see through his glasses, the Butcher shows up and steals the Beef Jerky despite the efforts of Word Girl and its security guard. Now far more powerful, the Butcher wipes the floor with Word Girl and leaves, only to later learn about the Bacon Earrings of Supreme Power, which can make him even stronger. Butcher returns for the earrings, but Huggy is able to use his glasses, which he still wears in costume, so how does this disguise help? To melt the earrings and allow himself to eat the jerky. This episode leans more on spectacle than anything previously. The Butcher could already put up a good fight against Word Girl, but giving him a power amplifier makes him genuinely imposing. Just compare his signature pastrami attack before and after he puts on the Beef Jerky of Supreme Power! Pastrami attack! Pastrami attack! <laughs> and the way he's defeated stands out as well. With Word Girl and Huggy unable to overcome the Butcher with brute force and without the time to make a plan like last time, they cleverly manage to weaponize Huggy's comedically large glasses. It'd be easy to assume this was just added to set up the feature word clumsy, but it's actually the crux of the climax, which was decently clever. Outside the Butcher, this is also the surprisingly late main series debut of Violet, and I can't help but take note of her voice. Her actress, Maria Bamford, does a fairly ordinary voice similar to the shorts, but she seems to be pitching herself up slightly. More significant, though, is how as the series progresses, Violet's voice becomes more whispery and enunciated, presumably to try and sell her airheaded side. Oh, hi, Bob. Are you okay? I don't see anything wrong with an entire day of recess. Speaking of voice acting, you know how Chris Parnell voices the narrator? Well, he gets two additional roles this episode. First as a TV news announcer. We interrupt this special report for another special report. And second as a museum guard, and I honestly didn't realize this was also him until I looked it up. The guard gets a surprising amount of screen time, but that's no problem, because he's actually a pretty charming character. Nice job. Well, I've watched your show. Oh, stop. Yes. Where am I? Yeah, apparently the Word Girl show exists inside the Word Girl show, don't worry about it. And then there's the museum curator, who is apparently extremely incompetent. I can maybe buy him displaying the Beef Jerky of Supreme Power in the city where the Butcher is known to reside, but not thinking to put away the Bacon Earrings of Supreme Power after the Beef Jerky is stolen is ridiculous even by this show's standards. There's a few other gags I really like, such as Bob trying to hide that he only half changed out of his costume, Becky claiming to have gotten lost in the exhibit that isn't there, and the Butcher's compliment to Word Girl. Hey, thanks. You know, you're not so bad, Word Girl. I <laughs> stop. <laughs> Too bad you're in the way. This is definitely one of the episodes I remember the most from watching as a kid. This is probably due in part to it just playing a lot, but it's also genuinely that memorable on its own. It has more spectacle and tension than usual, while not sacrificing the goofy tone that works so well for the show. I am a bit disappointed that we never get to see the Butcher use the full set's powers beyond summoning a meat storm that doesn't do anything, but that's an extremely minor gripe. The Beef Jerky of Supreme Power is a powerful necklace that belonged to the great Tryptophanian leader, Butcher Mesh. So, we all agree this guy is the Butcher's ancestor, right? You can almost feel the electricity in the air! One day, at the city's power plant, a giant ball of electricity randomly forms, and the employees try and stop it from growing using random mad science gizmos. How about we hit it with the gamma radiation ray? Ultimately, though, when the orb is sprayed with soda, it transforms into a giant energy monster. 
Meanwhile, Becky's family is setting up for a surprise birthday party, and Becky's parents almost make the connection between her and Word Girl before Bob distracts them. Becky herself uses her super speed to finish the errand she was asked to go on, alone, and the narrator accidentally spoils her surprise party. When Becky learns about the energy monster, she flies off to fight her, Okay, no more Mr. Nice Girl! but is unable to combat something made of electricity. After meeting a shopping Dr. Two Brain, she decides to drain the energy monster into the city's power grid. Needing Huggy's help, she goes home to recruit him as Word Girl, in the process getting super spoiled on her birthday party. We have to fight the pony monster! I mean, the electricity pony! I guarantee there's at least 10 different decade-old My Little Pony OCs that fit that description. Word Girl and Huggy defeat the energy monster, albeit by draining her into the telephone lines and accidentally dumping her on two brains, and return to Becky's party so she can fake a surprise reaction that everyone buys because everyone in the show is approximately three times more gullible than the average real-life person. I saw this episode a lot as a kid as well, since it's paired with Jerky Jerk, but I wasn't really a big fan of it at the time. I honestly can't remember why though, because I absolutely loved this episode on rewatch. First off, the highlight. Dr. Tubrin showing up for absolutely no reason other than playing off of Word Girl for one minute, being the punchline at the end, and telling this joke. You're shopping? I thought you just stole everything. No, I steal the cheese. I buy the crackers. Huh. I love this sort of thing. The villains in the show sometimes feel less like criminals and more like eccentric street performers. The primary villain of this episode, the energy monster, is definitely a lot different than any others we've seen thus far. She's depicted as an animal or force of nature just trying to keep herself fed. Though, as the series progresses, she's shown to have some higher intelligence when a joke calls for it. I do prefer my villains having more personality, but I like how the occasional non-malicious but dangerous anyway monster that doesn't speak adds a bit more variety to the roster. I also really like the energy monster's sounds. While she doesn't have a proper voice actor, the pulsing sounds when she moves and her staticky roars are some of my favorite bits of sound design in the show. They're just fun to listen to. And I'm not even someone who pays much attention to sound design normally. Word Girl herself also gets to shine here. Over the course of the episode, she switches from excitement over her party to worriedly trying to fake surprise to failing to look professional when recruiting Bob. I'm especially a fan of her frustrated muttering when she first fights the energy monster. I haven't given much props to Dana Furman, her voice actress thus far, but she really nails the personality of a preteen episode in the. But she really nails the personality of a preteen superhero in this episode specifically. Speaking of voice acting, I'd like to give an honorable mention to the power plant employees. They were hilarious. Gamma radiation ray! There's a lot of really good smaller jokes in this episode as well, like Scoop's also failing to keep Becky's party a secret, Trevor's outlet store, Word Girl accidentally mixing up power lines and phone lines, and some of the citizens' reactions to the energy monster's rampage. Every power source it eats just makes it... What's the word? Hugeify? Embiggen? Embiggen. This episode was definitely way more of a highlight than I expected, and has honestly gotten me excited for other episodes that I'll find more enjoyable as an adult, and not in the they hit a bunch of dirty jokes way. Oh, uh, what was that? You're wondering why I called the energy monster a her? I'll explain later. Does your kind ever think about love, Chuck? What do you mean, my kind? Chuck the evil sandwich making guy robs the gold store, only for the cashier to be confused about why Chuck isn't stealing sandwiches. Becky is at the grocery store with her dad, but least it stopped Chuck when exposition guy yells about the robbery. Uh, sure, sweetie. I'll see you at home. Hmm. It's not rice. Well, if it's not rice, then what is it? I don't care how good people taste. This stuff's costing me more than lobster. Word Girl, who agrees with the cashier's confusion for some reason, fails to apprehend Chuck and tries to figure out where he'll strike next while Tim prepares a unique dish known as Beans a la Vatsford. Chuck steals a supercar and we get a montage of multiple citizens thinking he wants to steal sandwich- HA! More proof that hot dogs are sandwiches! Anyway, Chuck gets so annoyed with everyone that he decides to pull the ultimate sandwich related crime out of spite, robbing the grocery store of bread and dumping Word Girl and Captain Huggy Face into his evil bread maker of doom. Catchy name. Word Girl and Huggy get trapped inside a giant loaf of bread, but Huggy is able to free them with a giant burp thanks to the aforementioned beans, and Chuck is swiftly defeated. This is an annoying episode for me because it's packed with really funny parts and really frustrating parts. On the positive side, there's stuff like It's Not Rice, Chuck's annoyance with everyone leading to him overcompensating on the sandwich theme, and the main series debut of Exposition Guy. He is particularly good here because he gets multiple appearances that ramp up the absurdity until he mistakes his own house for the police station. This is your house. I'm your wife. 
I thought you looked familiar. On the other hand, the beans a la Botsford gag doesn't really land in between the paste joke early on and Huggy bringing the dish to the fight at the end and the citizens' bafflement over Chuck's crimes. Oh boy. I'm perfectly willing to excuse people being daft or gullible or forgetful if it's funny or it sets up an otherwise interesting story, we'll come back to that in the next episode, but this episode is not entertaining enough to justify how bizarre and annoying it is that everyone thinks Chuck should only be stealing sandwich stuff. I know that Dr. Two Brains is a thing on the show, but not every villain needs to define their targets by their theme. Does the Butcher steal meat? Does Dr. Octopus steal sea creatures? Does the Joker steal clown things? Okay, probably yes for that last one. I'm willing to concede that the people being unreasonable might have been the intended point, but it's not enough to make up for how unfunny and repetitive it can get, no matter how hilarious the episode's ultimate punchline is. What was he stealing again? Thirteen dollars in baked goods and fresh produce. Really? Was that all I had? I want to like this episode, it's the sort of goofy I watched the show for, but I'd honestly end up just skipping chunks of it if I was watching it again for fun. Don't hurt my suit! <laughs> this is the same world whose civilian population just loves to turn on its heroes at any opportunity. While TJ is telling Becky tall tales about Word Girl, Granny Mae steals an expensive tiara from the jewelry store. Becky sees this and confronts Granny as Word Girl, but Granny tricks everyone into thinking Word Girl deliberately injured her, causing seemingly everyone but TJ to turn on Word Girl. She tries to catch Granny Mae committing a different crime, but once again gets tricked into making herself look worse. When Granny Mae is asked to greet a visiting foreign queen, TJ attends the event and insists Word Girl isn't a bad guy, while Word Girl herself shows up and exposes Granny Mae for stealing the queen's crown. Granny tries to trick the populace again, but fails and ends up defeated, vindicating Word Girl and TJ's faith in her. This is another example of the populace behaving less than competently, but unlike Chuck exclamation point, it's less egregious because 1. them being actively tricked puts the episode in a different context, and 2. the city being turned against Word Girl is an interesting, engaging concept, and honestly the scenarios Granny Mae sets up are actually more realistically believable than I remember. Faking an injury with no witnesses to contradict her, and making a donation look like a robbery to trick Word Girl into wrongfully restraining her. Not to mention the fact that she has fake tiaras made and is apparently mastered sleight of hand. But the big highlight for this episode was actually TJ of all people. First off, while I might be reading too much into this, I like to think his exaggerated Word Girl stories at the beginning were a deliberate parallel to Granny Mae maliciously lying about Word Girl. Second, this episode puts TJ's obsession with Word Girl under a new light by showing him unwaveringly support her even as everyone else is fooled by Granny Mae. He's not some vapid fanboy who is easily kowtowed into turning against Word Girl or just going silent, he's vocal about still thinking Word Girl is a good person. It shows genuine loyalty, and I'd like to think Becky would be legitimately proud and touched if she had time to process this before being paralyzed by TJ's bad and creepy song at the end. Okay. Oh yeah, that reminds me, number three, TJ gets some pretty good jokes in this episode too. From the aforementioned hilariously bad ode to Word Girl, to him being tricked into leaving Becky alone via exploiting his desire to impress Word Girl, to him retorting against Becky's synonyms for not awesome. Becky, yes? You're totally regular. Better. TJ definitely carries this episode, but I can't not mention the telephone gag at the Queen's greeting event. Word Girl's going to knit a pair of booties for Granny Mae and make her wear them on her spacewalk! Dad, what does that even mean? Oh, and let's not forget Word Girl openly admitting that she lied to people to get in. You're not the only one who can deceive people, Granny Mae! No, but in this case it was good that I deceived you. Smooth. I'm sure you'll never get in trouble for lying to people in the future. I actually remember not enjoying this episode as a kid because I found Word Girl being mistrusted to be kind of stressful, and my opinion on TJ's song was about the same as Word Girl's, but it's way better in retrospect. This feels like one of the more unique episodes of Season 1 for the slightly different tone and the position Word Girl is forced into, and it ended up helping me appreciate TJ as a character far more than I ever expected to coming into this retrospective. What? Oh, um, it looks like we ran out of prizes. That's embarrassing. But remember, dodgeball is a sport of violence, exclusion, and degradation. We get to see the mayor and his talking cards for the first time as he gives a speech at the opening of the new library. Toby, however, interrupts and threatens to destroy the library with his robots to draw Word Girl out. Word Girl destroys the robots, simultaneously criticizing how predictable Toby's plots have gotten. The next day, basically the same events play out. The day after that, Toby shows up with so many robots that Word Girl is forced to surrender. Unwilling to give up her secret identity or let the library be destroyed, Word Girl decides to settle things with the game of... Dodgeball. Against Toby and his 50 robots. 
The game goes well for Word Girl until she gets out trying to protect Huggy, but Huggy clinches the win by catching a ball with his mouth. Toby and his robots are subsequently forced to work in the library. One of the featured words of this episode is predictable, and I like how the plot plays off this. Toby is directly criticized for his predictable plans by Word Girl, and the library set piece is repeated enough that everyone becomes self-aware and bored by the third time. At the library, the mayor is giving a thrilling speech about the new library. Again. But then the episode takes a hard turn into something decidedly unpredictable, with the final battle being a game of dodgeball. Word Girl getting out and Huggy being the one to win it is clearly meant to be along that same idea, though I feel like the episode would have been stronger if it had been more Huggy-focused throughout to make his victory feel more climactic. Another thing I like about the dodgeball game is the narrator's role. Having him commentate on the game just makes a lot of sense, and it adds a way more humorous vent to it. Uh-oh, looks like Toby is about to fire. Now's the time to grab a snack. <laughs> My other favorite jokes were Word Girl pointing out the random hazards that Toby could have utilized instead of robots, Word Girl imitating Toby, the robots working at the library, and one of the mayor's speeches making Sally think the library has a pool inside it. Mayor said there was a pool. No talking in library. Sorry! I said no talking. Speaking of Toby, I think this is the most entertaining depiction of him thus far. He's presented as a threat, but is shown to be considerably more pathetic when he's forced to do stuff on his own instead of purely relying on his robots. I also like how this solidifies him as a villain focused on trying to learn Word Girl's secret identity, for reasons I discussed in the last video. Oh, and he also tries to threaten destroying a building, one Word Girl would naturally have a stronger affection for at that, as blackmail to get a date with Word Girl. Yeah, this episode is definitely on the more negative side of depicting Toby's crush. Don't worry, Tobeki shippers, we'll get to something less creepy before too long. All I'm saying is that robots are a little... a crowd, say it with me. Predictable! Predictable. Buy it. Buy it. Buy it. Buy it. In a penthouse office, high above the city... A masked man prepares to carry out his plan for the city, a plan involving the thing. Before long, advertisements for The Thing, a featureless white cube, are everywhere, and everyone except Becky seems oddly fixated on it. After trying and failing to quell Thing-obsessed citizens in the grocery store, Word Girl learns the product is produced by Mr. Big Industries and flies off to confront the company's CEO. Mr. Big tries to sell The Thing with the same vague language as all his ads and insists he's not doing anything wrong, but it's soon revealed he's using mind control to make people buy it. Mr. Big uses mind control to turn Captain Huggy Face against Word Girl and prepares to mind control her as well, but Word Girl uses Huggy's artificial obsession with the thing to her advantage and creates an opening to destroy the mind control device. Remember what I said last video about sunset shots in this show? This episode uses a lot of that, and it really helps with the tone, only amplified with how surprisingly ominous Mr. Big is depicted early on and how obviously threatening the idea of a mind control device is. While Mr. Big ends up being as goofy as most other villains in the show, this very episode introduces his obsession with squishy bunny toys, his debut really leaves an impression. This is helped even further by Mr. Big's tactics. Using mind-controlling advertisements is more subtle than other villainous plans in the show, and it actually adds another layer if you really want to see it. It's really easy to look at this episode as a thinly layered allegory for companies selling useless things with slick ads and exploiting consumerism and fear of missing out to get people hyped up. Not only does this make the episode deeper, it's also a pretty good lesson for kids who may be more easily influenced by advertisements and hype. I'd also like to touch on Leslie. Early on, she seems like a fairly loyal and chipper secretary, but over the course of Season 1, Maria Bambert alters her voice little by little to make her more monotone and tired sounding. By her first appearance in Season 2, her voice is flatter than late series Violet. The one with the clowns and the roast beef sandwich? They're calling it the Mega Object and saying it's even better than the Thing. And I will be his Deputy Secretary of Communication Relations and Internal Policies Relating to Governmental Bureaucracy. I like to think this was on purpose, like she progressively gets more tired of Mr. Big's failures and her own lack of credit and recognition. Also, this episode has probably my favorite word definition in the entire show. And vague means? Not specific. And specific means? Not vague. Oh. <laughs> My only major issue with the episode is a specific joke near the end. While Word Girl is restrained by Huggy and Mr. Big is about to mind control her, the narrator does a dramatic cliffhanger but is interrupted by Word Girl saying it's not needed. The narrator's response is to take this as Word Girl saying he's not needed, getting upset, and leaving until the very end of the episode. This is a good gag in theory, but in practice it happens very abruptly and it doesn't feel right for the narrator to get so upset this suddenly. I think it would have worked out a lot better if it was a running gag through the episode. If the narrator was narrating a lot more, Word Girl kept asking him to stop because it was distracting, and it hit a boiling point in the climax. 
I didn't like this joke even as a kid, but I think this change would have made it both funnier and more natural. So basically my critique of this episode is similar to how I felt about the original Chuck shorts. A bad joke near the end, but it overall pretty funny and makes a good introduction to a new villain, and the more ominous tone makes it even more distinct. And they're not even using mind control? It appears not, sir. The power of capitalism is strong enough to surpass even mind control. Be very afraid. You are grounded for till college. For till college! For till college! <laughs> the butcher tries to get money from the bank via lunch meat checks, but after he feels insulted by the teller, he decides to just rob the place. Becky prepares to fly off and stop him, but when Tim sees how messy her room is, he grounds her until she cleans it up. The butcher then attacks the grocery store, and Becky tries to fly off again, but is caught by her dad, who miraculously mistakes Becky wearing the word girl costume for her playing dress up, who notes that he never grounded Bob. Bob goes off to face the butcher alone as Captain Huggyface, using his belt communicator to keep Word Girl in touch. However, the butcher gets upset when it looks like Word Girl doesn't consider him a big enough threat to fight personally. While the butcher restrains Huggy, Becky cleans her room with super speed, but in a surprising, if inconvenient, show of intelligence, Tim assumes she just shoved everything in the closet. The butcher goes to rob City Hall to prove how dangerous he is, but he cools off when he overhears Tim on Huggy's communicator and realizes Word Girl was actually just grounded. Word Girl shows up to beat the Butcher, who is happy Word Girl still takes him seriously. This is a pretty obvious premise for a young kid superhero show, being unable to fight crime because you're grounded. It leads to some pretty funny antics between Becky and her dad, as well as forcing Huggy to go solo. The Butcher's reaction in particular, a misunderstanding that seems to spark some kind of inferiority complex, is funny, sad, and interesting all at once. This is probably my favorite episode for The Butcher so far. I especially like the punchline of Huggy and The Butcher preparing for an ultimate battle at City Hall until it's abruptly interrupted by Tim's voice coming through the communicator. While I would have liked to see Huggy actually do more stuff solo, the setup and timing were amazing here. The lunch meat checks thing was... weird. It's a funny concept and is clearly there to provide an example for the featured word preposterous, but it's kind of one note and gets dropped from the butcher's repertoire after the grocery store. After that, he just uses his regular abilities to rob City Hall. Getting back to Huggy, I'd actually say he's the highlight here despite everything the butcher gets up to. I always like seeing him go solo for the uniqueness of it and the chance to see what tactics he uses on his own as opposed to being part of a duo. This is also the first episode where I really started paying attention to his noises. James Adomian does a really good job doing Huggy's squeaks, chirps, and groans, and makes him a lot more entertaining to watch. We can stay in touch with our communicators. Chicken wings. This was a really fun episode, and I like how keeping Wordgirl out of action for most of it lent it more of a unique feel. And your total comes out to... Whoa, a whole big load of money. Something something joke about modern grocery prices. Everything is out of control. <laughs> I forgot the mice were ninjas in this episode. An argument between Becky and TJ is interrupted when Dr. Two Brains hijacks the TV signal to broadcast himself making a super intelligent army of mice. Things go wrong though when the mice are made too smart and they go off on their own. Word goal goes to see Edith von Husinghaus, owner of Two Brains' target, Glow Cheeses. How much do you want to bet those things are radioactive? The mice overwhelm Word Girl and Huggy and steal the cheese before Two Brains can show up. Two Brains tries to pretend he's still in control of the mice, but when he discovers the mice stole from his personal cash, he makes a truce with Word Girl to stop the mice together, despite the narrator's trepidations. The mice break into the grocery store with the literal Trojan mouse, but Word Girl and Two Brains succeed in locking them all up. Unfortunately, Do bad, I'm evil! Two Brains is seemingly assured victory is dashed, however, when the mice break out of their cage. Word Gold uses Two Brains' intelligent ray to return the mice to normal, and Two Brains is stuck rolling down the street on the giant cheese wheel both he and the mouse tried to steal. And as the episode ends, we see the first super smart mouse slip through the cracks and is still active. I legitimately have no idea if this ever comes up again. This is the first time Word Girl ever teams up with a villain, and it feels appropriate that it's Dr. Two Brains. These mice are beyond both of us unless we work together. Like old times? I have to admit, the mouse army itself isn't the most impressive threat. The most enhanced intelligence thing it does is building the Trojan mouse, and the mice seem to rely a lot on just brute force in the situation. Maybe Stampede wasn't the best choice of featured word for an episode involving a smart ray. That said, they are at least able to coordinate well, and they feel threatening enough to feel worthy of a word girl villain team up. Them being creations of Dr. Two Brains provides an even stronger justification via the villain gets in over their head trope, and the plan he and Word Girl come up with is also pretty simple, but seem to require just enough 
enough coordination to justify needing them to work together to pull it off. I think it would have been better though if it involved one or two other devices of Two Brains so that he could get to do more than just lock a cage at the right time. But of course, Two Brains is not above stabbing Word Girl in the back to get the cheese for himself. A twist that's pretty obvious but still pulled off entertainingly. And Two Brains' vanity and underestimation of others proves to be his ultimate downfall. He's so caught up in supposedly beating Word Girl that he's too late to stop the mice from breaking out, leaving Word Girl to clear everything up and leave Two Brains tumbling down the road. I like Two Brains lamenting about how he almost won, as if his villainy is now almost as much about his ego as it is about the cheese. I am Dr. Two Brains! I was going to win! I was going to beat Word Girl! Before the climax though, there's a lot of smaller endearing ones moments like Two Brains changing battle poses from Sinister to Determined, or him accidentally making Word Girl think he knew her secret identity. Hello, Word Girl! <gasps> and I guess whoever else is watching, hello as well. <sighs> I legitimately didn't even get that last joke until this most recent viewing, which goes to show why this retrospectives can be so surprising and funny. I do think this episode needed to sell its spectacle a bit more for a story about Word Girl teaming up with a villain, especially the first shot at that concept, but you could have done a lot worse, and it's still pretty fun. Please accept this large wooden mouse and put it next to your giant wheel of cheese. Anyway, help! That's titanium steel alloy, the strongest substance known to man. Why would you need that in a grocery store? I only buy the best. You know, I actually work at a grocery store currently, and sometimes I think I'd prefer to work at this grocery store. Sure, you have to put up with stuff like stampeding mice, lunch meat checks, and giant bread makers, but considering how boring my job can get, I think I'd prefer all that. Becky is at art class when Toby is introduced as a new student. Toby is certain that he will be an artistic prodigy, but soon realizes art is much more difficult than he expected. Desperate to not look bad, Toby has a robot make a shockingly good painting, but it turns out that everyone saw him hold his canvas up to a window so a building-sized robot could paint it. Toby, what were you expecting? When Miss Champlain threatens to tell Toby's mother he didn't complete his assignment, Toby has his robot make a sculpture out of a bus with people inside. However, the robot decides to simply paint a mural over the bus instead. When Miss Champlain gives the robot a gold star and not Toby, he makes the robot go berserk. Becky becomes Word Girl to fight the robot, but it just evolves into her and Huggy posing for yet another painting. Even more fed up, Toby summons a massive golden super robot. Word Girl, Huggy, and Artsy try to fight the super robot, but it proves to be effectively indestructible and overwhelms them. However, when Artsy paints a portrait of the super robot and ends up so moved by the beauty of it that it takes the portrait and... flies away somewhere. Uh... bye, I guess. Toby is forced to model for the art class, and Artsy probably gets adopted by Miss Champlain or something. This and the following episode might just be the most nostalgic pair of episodes for me. Everything from Artsy shenanigans, to the super robot appearing, to Violet saying Becky's painting is better than Toby's, to Toby's angry ranting while needing to smile for the art students kept a warm, nostalgic smile on my face the whole rewatch. Much like Toby or Consequences, this episode leans more on Toby being an immature kid, shown here with how poorly he reacts to not being an instant art master, and in particular, how fixated he gets on earning a silly little sticker. Where's my shiny sticker? I ran out. That's not fair! It's nice when they take advantage of Toby being a kid villain beyond him just being at school or crushing on fellow kid Word Girl. Speaking of the crush though, this is actually the first Toby episode where it doesn't factor in at all, not even as an offhand joke. While I think the crush is a good running gag, I think holding back on it sometimes is a good call to prevent it from getting tiresome. You don't want one of your primary characters to feel too one note. This is also the first time we see Toby interact with fellow kids aside from just Becky. Unfortunately, it's not really that interesting or funny. He acts all smug and superior to everyone else, that makes sense, but he seems to focus more on the authority figure Miss Champlain than any of the fellow students. We do get one interaction between Toby and Violet, pairing I hope we get to see at least a little more of later on. Maybe your remote's broken. It's fine. Battery's dead? I checked them this morning. But aside from that, the kids are essentially just an audience. I'd have liked to see more. I do at least like how they're used to turn gasp, one of the featured words, into a decent running gag. <gasps> Alright, seriously, you people are very distracting. Ah, but then we get the new breakup character, Artsy the Robot. It's completely silent throughout the episode, which I guess is a bit odd considering we've seen robots talk before, but I like how it's able to convey a lot of charm through facial expressions and body language alone. 
I love the implication that Toby may have indirectly created a lot of trouble for himself by introducing the robot to art and sparking a passion, causing it to grow beyond its programming. Hilariously enough, this isn't even the last time the show has an ostensibly generic and replaceable MOOC find a passion that leads them to rebel against their master and exit the episode seemingly unscathed and on the path to a better life. The Super Robot is… fine. It's just another Toby robot that happens to be golden and invincible. I think it suffers from the fact that the episode fixates so much on it being indestructible that it forgets to let the super robot actually… do things. The only actual attack it gets off is just throwing artsy. I think it could have done with showing off more weaponry than just a claw hand. That said, the super robot does get the funniest moment of the episode. hit the Samba button. Honestly, this episode isn't quite as good as I remember it being. It's fine, it's funny, it gets to be a bit thought-provoking, but none of these aspects are played up enough to make it a genuinely great episode. I hesitate to say it's a disappointment, but there's definitely a little missed potential here. Serichiriusai Matarame, a great sinner of vanity whose talent has been exhausted. You are an artist who uses his authority to shamelessly steal the ideas of his pupils. We have decided to make you confess all your crimes with your own mouth. We will take your distorted desires without fail. From the Phantom Thieves. Give me the hamburger. No! I don't want the sandwich. Since his last appearance, Chuck has apparently turned his life around and is now working for a company selling pencils and rubber bands. His boss, Mr. Callahan, shows up to praise Chuck. I like to call my employees by their last name. What's your last name? Chuck, the evil sandwich making guy... Guy! So apparently in the original Chuck shorts, he decided on the spot to just use his real name instead of an alias. Who'd have thought? When Mr. Callahan is asked about lunch, though, he reveals that he utterly despises sandwiches, as in all sandwiches as a whole, for unclear reasons. If you're saying this next to a guy with a sandwich head, I think you need to work on your situational awareness. Meanwhile, Becky and Violet disagree on whether to paint a unicorn or a pegasus for their art project. They compromise by deciding to combine the creatures, but get stuck on the name. And we call it a unicorn. Just call it an alicorn, guys. It's not that hard. Chuck tries to talk to Mr. Callahan about sandwiches, but Callahan refuses to budge, so Chuck traps him in a vat and threatens to fill it with goop for every sandwich he refuses. Becky catches wind of this and pops in as Word Girl. Chuck and Word Girl fight until Mr. Callahan reveals he likes grilled cheeses, having apparently never realized that they're sandwiches. Chuck is once again arrested, upset that everything he did turned out to be pointless. The weakest part of this episode is the Violet subplot. There's a reason I barely mentioned it in the summary. It consists only of Becky and Violet arguing over what to call their combo creature, which isn't that interesting and gets stale… <laughs> pretty quickly. It's a decent excuse to define the featured word compromise, but it was already thrown around a bunch in the main plot so I don't think this subplot was necessary. Heck, it takes up so little screen time that it feels even more superfluous, though I guess I'm glad it didn't waste too much time. The only other thing of note is that it fleshes out Violet's personality a bit more by showing how head in the clouds she can be. That honestly was pretty funny. Violet going all Bye. almost made the subplot worth it. Thankfully, the main plot was a lot better. A villain finding an honest job but slipping back into villainy is a good premise, and Chuck fits it pretty well, hence why something like this happens at least one more time in the future. For most of the first act, he really feels just like an ordinary guy with an office job. When Chuck gets so angry he returns to his villain costume and traps Mr. Callahan in goop, it actually feels kind of sad in a way. Sure, Chuck getting angry at Mr. Callahan not liking sandwiches is an overreaction, but Mr. Callahan's stubbornness and lack of self-awareness makes that at least a bit understandable. Even Word Girl tries to convince him to at least taste a sandwich. Even when he does go bad though, Chuck is still a bit of a nice guy. He's surprisingly polite when asking Mr. Callahan to push the goop button for him, and he gladly gives the rejected sandwiches to people watching to make sure they're not wasted. I thought the brief action scene was pretty fun. Rather short and not the most in-depth, but it was neat to see Word Girl and Huggy bounce on the giant rubber bands. I like when action scenes use creative set pieces like that. The ending is… oddly depressing. I touched earlier on how Chuck returning to villainy is kinda sad, but the ending shows us Chuck lamenting how everything could have been avoided, Word Girl apologizing to Chuck for everything that went down, and even Mr. Callahan being sad he's lost his best employee. This is just an odd episode overall. Given that Mr. Callahan is taller than the bat, there's not even any risk of him drowning, so I'm not even sure what Chuck's game plan was. Well, I guess Mr. Callahan could just duck down into the goop. As he does. Because he apparently saw a nickel at the bottom. Through all that goop? Well, I have good eyesight. What is with these people? 
Yes, you get to borrow Mr. Botsford and his great smashing abilities for an entire week! Does this count as giving away a person as a prize? What is with this game show, too? Happy birthday, happy birthday, whoop-dee-doo, whoop-dee-doo! In for a smattering of Violet content, in for a heap of it, I guess. Becky and Violet are flying kites when they meet Eileen, a girl whose birthday is apparently that very day. Eileen turns out to be rather greedy, as epitomized when she grows in size upon not getting what she wants. She proceeds to steal Bob, so Violet and Becky split up to track Eileen down. While Eileen plays with Bob, who doesn't entirely hate it, mostly due to the fact that she makes some cookies, Violet and Word Girl end up meeting and decide to search for Eileen and Bob together. They find them when Eileen decides she wants a giant gold star from the top of a building and climbs up to take it. The ape should be holding a girl, correct? Word Girl is unable to beat Eileen, but Violet convinces her to give up her necklace as a gift. Since she did something generous, Eileen shrinks back to normal and the day is saved. Not every day is saved, though, as Eileen reveals that she believes every day is her birthday. Eileen, aka the titular birthday girl, seems to be one of the less discussed villains in the Word Girl fandom. While the concept of the Hulk except for greed instead of anger is fun, her being greedy and bratty is the bulk of her screen time, so I could see how one would think this gets stale and annoying. I will say though, the implication that she really wants to have friends, as shown in her interactions with Violet, does lend her a bit more intrigue, although it's not necessarily something you'd notice immediately. I think it's telling that it's this angle that helps Violet wring some generosity out of her and thus countering her greed powers. My favorite thing about Eileen though is her cutesy talk. I can see how someone might find it grating, but I don't really mind it, and I like how it underlines how she's more immature than even Toby. The best part though is how much Becky completely hates hearing Eileen talk like this. Pretty please. Ugh, please, it's pretty please. It makes perfect sense that the vocabulary superhero would be infuriated by someone mangling the English language like this when they should probably know better, and her indignation is just funny to watch, especially when Violet herself starts talking like Eileen near the end. I'm one of your bestest friends? Really? Of course you are! Ugh, guys, you're killing me here! Speaking of Violet though, this is definitely her best and most in-depth showing yet. We see how her niceness can be exploited when Eileen pressures her into letting her keep her kite, but when Eileen and Becky start fighting over Bob, Violet steps in and supports Becky with an angry fervor that even Becky admits to having never seen before. Well, it's okay for people to take my stuff, but nobody, NOBODY messes with my friends! This sternness even comes back later when Reginald gets a bit too insulting and disbelieving of Violet and Word Girl's story. It's really nice for Violet to show more layers than just nice and airheaded, though we do get a bit of those as well. Wow, it's so blue up here. Well, uh, yeah, blue. And Violet's determination to find her best friend's pet combined with her being the one to figure out Eileen's weakness and take advantage of it cements this as her biggest time to shine yet. We get to see her be a hero and form a real bond with Word Girl instead of just being the best friend of Word Girl's civilian identity. Uh, it was great teaming up with you, Violet. Same here, word girl. Same here. Arrivederci. Okay, so we got TJ, Toby, apparently Scoops, Tommy from the game show. Why didn't you just buzz? Also, the eyes of word girl are dazzling. Her eyes. And I'm counting Violet as the fifth person to have a crush on word girl. Guess it comes with the territory of being a superhero. Though if this was more realistic, it'd be the villains who get armies of people crushing on them. You're cozy and warm in your bed, my dear. Please, go the f*** to sleep. While Tim and Sally are visiting a cat art exhibit, they've hired Granny Mae of all people to be their kid's babysitter. Granny Mae is very anxious to get the kids to bed as early as possible, and Becky soon overhears that she plans to steal the Mazo Racer, a super fast golden car. Becky is forced to sneak out to stop Granny Mae, but the two's fight is interrupted when an alarm Granny set up reveals TJ left his room. After both return to the Botsford house briefly, they once again leave to fight over the car, then go back to the house again, then fight over the car again, and Word Girl is finally able to defeat Granny Mae. Tim and Sally return home, and Tim tries to pay an inflatable decoy of Granny Mae. Granny Mae tends to have the most variance in her plans. Sometimes she's openly robbing people, sometimes she's scamming people, and sometimes she's using babysitting duties to give herself an alibi for a crime. It's a pretty good plan, honestly, especially when taking into account her alarms to prevent the kids from exposing her. However, I honestly think I'd prefer if they used a different villain for this premise, if only for the sheer lunacy in, say, Chuck or Dr. Two Brains trying to take care of kids. While this episode's plot is pretty repetitive and predictable, the jokes are… mostly good. The stuff at the Botsford house mostly falls flat, but anything taking place during Granny Mae's attempted robberies is pretty funny, mostly because of the Mazo Racer's driver… Hey lady! Don't go running off without your 
Walker! Your passenger side window is not rolled up all the way. Ah, uh, you got me there. Hey, try not to scratch the gold. And the narrator. That is breakneck speed for his snail. <laughs> is this the end of Captain Huggy Face, the driver, and the Mesa Racer? Does the Mesa Racer have good insurance? Did you check to see if the emergency brake is on? Is the parking brake on? And, uh... The entire episode takes place at night, and night shots are pretty rare in this series, and... What's with those inflatable decoys? I mean, Becky and Bob put up their own even though TJ wouldn't see them, and... Okay, I gotta be honest, there isn't much to talk about with this episode. It is funny, it's an episode I'd recommend watching, but the jokes are really the only distinct and engaging parts of the episode. There's no major problems to deconstruct, no interesting character beats to discuss, it's just... An amusing 11-minute superhero story that teaches kids words. This really puts into focus how amazing it is that most other episodes have more worth talking about. Show them what they've won! An official word girl tunnel to the center of the Earth mobile! Before long, they're gonna send one of these kids to space as a prize. For the cost of sending an email, we can vote for Shin Megami Tensei Nocturne. After Word Girl takes down the extremely pathetic Amazing Rope guy, she's approached by the mayor, who is anxious about an upcoming election, particularly since Mr. Big is his opponent. Mr. Big plans to mind control people into voting for him, but all his mind control devices are apparently out of batteries. Yes, an entire company is apparently out of batteries. Thus, Mr. Big reluctantly decides to play a bit more clean by making a bunch of promises to random citizens. Word Girl believes Mr. Big has an evil plan lined up, but can't arrest him because he hasn't technically done anything illegal yet. Mr. Big's promises seem to work for a time, but some voters turn against him when he starts to fall behind. The polls open, and it ends up in exact tie, with only Tim Botsford left to break it. Unable to decide at first, he's convinced to vote for the mayor by Word Girl, but Mr. Big puts him under mind control, having finally gotten new batteries. A fight over the mind control device breaks out, but it drags on so long that the polls end up closing, meaning they need to take votes all over again. Mr. Big, out of patience, rants about how he'll just use mind control to take the victory and carry out his evil plan. Every citizen will have to dress like a giant, fuzzy, squishy, bunny bunny, see? Um... Okay, I deliberately avoided making a joke like this last time, but this is 99% of the way to forcing everyone to wear fursuits. Although I guess technically rubber suits would be more accurate? However, Captain Huggyface broadcasts Mr. Big saying all this live, putting an end to his mayoral ambitions. So we're two for two on Mr. Big episodes having some sort of social critique. Last time it was on consumerism, now it's on political promises and cheap, vapid bids for voters. Mr. Big is constantly either going along with over-the-top and sometimes contradictory requests, or giving out meaningless gifts like a giant box of candy. And the sad thing is, while a decent chunk of voters don't buy his nonsense, literally half of the voter base is suckered in even to the point of ignoring the advice of a trusted public figure. I guess it's hard not to have some sort of political commentary in a story literally about an election, but the specific angle the episode goes for makes it hard for me to believe the writers weren't trying for this sort of message. Another aspect of Mr. Big's tactics here that I think is neat is how they're a direct result of him being put out of his element. He is specifically locked out from using mind control until the climax, so he needs to come up with an alternate idea. And while his ideas work, he doesn't seem to have the best grasp on their limits. When he learns voters are turning against him, his reaction is just to double down on bribing people. I guess it's easy to get stuck in that mindset when mind control is such a powerful and versatile concept. While Mr. Big manages to be both engaging and entertaining here... Please, this is no time for debate! Huh? Word Girl herself is shockingly underutilized. Aside from the cold open with Amazing Rope Guy, all she does until the fight at the polls is try to expose wrongdoings that aren't happening and ineffectually warn people against voting for Mr. Big. If an episode is trying to be Word Girl light, that's fine, but this one feels like it wants her to drive the plot but doesn't have anything for her to do until the end. Tim's usage is similarly disappointing. While he's ironically a bit more relevant to the plot than Word Girl since... Well, he's a registered voter. Most of his screen time is just him flip-flopping between Mr. Big and the mayor. We get some funny moments, like him failing to handle the pressure of being the tiebreaker. Every citizen in town is counting on you. Waiting. Watching. You chew your nails. But on the whole, he just ends up getting very repetitive. I think the saving graces of this episode are the candidates themselves. The mayor in particular gets more screen time than ever before to show off his clueless but well-meaning demeanor. I'd have wanted to see them actually debate each other more, but what we got was a fine, if somewhat flat, election story. Here's hoping the next election story is a bit more entertaining. By a show of hands, who wants Toby? Robots can't vote. Alright, I always suspected it. 
Hmm. Okay, I sometimes suspected it. A vocabulary competition is taking place at the city's convention center. And backup aquarium. And Becky is naturally participating, while Scoops is reporting on the competition even though he doesn't want to. Becky leaves when she hears the butcher plotting a crime, which makes Scoops suspicious. The butcher is setting up for a big bank robbery involving a giant pot of chili, but he isn't ready yet, so Wurgle decides to return to the competition for the moment. Did we actually fight any crime just then? <laughs> Scoops confronts Becky and catches the lingering scent of chili as the news reports on the butcher's antics. Becky asks to do all her words for the next few rounds all at once and the request is granted. Naturally, she defines everything perfectly, which somehow only scares a single competitor. Becky leaves for the bank again and sees a shocking amount of random people and junk lining the streets and sky alike, all of it apparently important. Word Girl then hears that the final round is about to start and she flies off again. Upon her return, Becky is once again confronted by Scoops, who becomes convinced that she is Word Girl. Desperate to hide her secret identity, Becky resorts to deliberately misdefining perfect, her final word, throwing the vocab B and making herself look bad but convincing Scoops that she can't be Word Girl. Word Girl returns to the bank in time for the butcher's robbery to… utterly fail. The butcher gives up and lets himself be arrested as he admits that everything kind of got away from him. Scoops then shows up and talks to Word Girl about Becky's failure. But then, she didn't know what the word perfect meant. Can you believe it? <laughs> uh, Scoops, you're supposed to be the less problematic Becky ship, right? When I was young, I actually disliked this episode because I found Becky almost losing her cover to be stressful to watch. I'm not sure if that says more about preteen me or the episode itself, but this is definitely one of the more tense episodes of season one. It'd be easy to say, how is Scoops only catching on now and never any previous times? But I'd argue it actually makes sense. This is a competition that Becky is clearly very passionate about, so her leaving in the middle and risking disqualification is pretty suspicious. And with that thought in his head, Scoops is able to pick up on clues he might not have noticed otherwise, like the similarities between Becky and Word Girl or Becky smelling of chili. And as a established both in this episode and previously, Scoops is desperate to land a big story and prove himself, and he can sometimes get prone to tunnel vision and failing to acknowledge the feelings of others. So when he gets a huge secret dropped in his lap, one he's been actively trying to uncover, of course he'd get ahead of himself and go ahead with writing the story without even acknowledging Becky's protests. Though while his excitement for the story is understandable, if still selfish, he does cross a line a little when he starts making light of Becky's loss, acting condescending to Becky's face and laughing about it to Word Girl. I almost want to think he's working off his frustration at losing the story, as he acts surprisingly upbeat after this loss. Aside from scoops, the vocab B itself has a lot of meat huh, to it. The main judge was a hoot, either literally counting down the seconds until the next round or talking about how he can get crazy sometimes, always with the same dull, posh tone. I'm pretty sure he never shows up again, but I'd love it if he reappeared for every future competition, no matter what the subject is. There's also the extremely nervous Jeremy, who ends up winning due to Becky's throw, a plate of cornbread that everyone is inexplicably fixated on, and this. For instance, that boy's bulging pockets make me suspicious of him. Jeez, Becky, you didn't have to single him out on stage or anything. Maybe you deserve everything Scoop said. And, of course, the very premise of a vocabulary competition allows a natural excuse for word definitions. Though even then, they have some fun with it, as the second featured word happens to be perfect, which Becky defines as... To massage a duck's feet while wearing rubber shoes! Wow. Is that ever wrong? And the judge ends up having to give the proper definition. Oh, but let's not forget the actual crime, which barely even happens. I love the buildup of all the nonsense the Butcher brings in, his insistence that everything is going according to plan, and Word Girl's utter bafflement. This is gonna be some crime. You wanna know what the Butcher's plan actually was? Here it is. Spill giant chili pot on bank so Hippo eats the bank walls. Yeah. Everything else was apparently just an effort to keep the Hippo happy, which led into a never-ending chain of keeping the other people he hired happy. And the whole way, the Butcher is the most personable he's ever been, happily letting Word Girl leave in return and even taking an interview with TV news. He's so happy to execute his plan, but resigns himself to his failure pretty quickly when the Hippo fails to eat the bank and makes all his efforts pointless. Actually, the Hippo's really the one who ruined the plan. Oh, well, I guess you're right. I knew I'd probably like this episode more than I did as a kid, but even then I was surprisingly impressed. It trades off between goofy Word Girl antics and a shockingly tense Becky story when you'd probably expect those two to be reversed. Becky's inner monologue on stage, and her subsequent not-so-inner conversation with the apparently omniscient narrator, was particularly good at conveying her stress and the narrator's shock at her plan. 
Definitely one of the season's best episodes. Say, what's all this jelly for, Mr. Butcher? Oh, please, just Butcher. Mr. Butcher's my dad. Uh... I seem to be stuck in a giant world of nightmare horrors. Ooh, a giant spider! An award is about to be given for the world's largest cheesecake, but Dr. Two Brains arrives with a shrink ray that allows him to easily scoop it up. Becky and Scoops later discuss the crime, and when Becky deduces Two Brains' next target will be a giant cheese wheel at the grocery store, why am I feeling deja vu? Scoops offers to take Becky along as his assistant, which Becky is all too pleased about. Stick with me, kid, and you'll go places. He called me kid. At his lair, Two Brains explains to his henchmen that while shrinking is simple, growing things requires a special fuel. What high-tech substance is required for such a feat? Parsnips! Parsnips? Parsnips! Cheese, potato salad, crackers, and now parsnips. Two Brains is gonna have a whole buffet to his name by the end of the series. Unfortunately, it turns out that the henchmen used the grow ray on the Nameless One's new bunny, in the process using up a decent chunk of Two Brains' parsnip supply. At the grocery store, Becky and Scoops wait for Two Brains, and Scoops wants to hide the fact they're reporters for some reason? But when he shows up, he ends up shrinking Scoops and the store manager alongside the cheese wheel. All are taken by the henchmen. Meanwhile, high above the city in a giant inflatable mouse... Another crate of parsnips is used up on Charlie's hat, and Word Girl intercepts the blimp. She tries to stop Two Brains from shrinking a cheese... train, but gets shrunk herself, and Two Brains gets away. Word Girl and Huggy arrive at Two Brains' hideout, only to find out that all of the parsnips have been used up now, and nothing can be regrown. However, the grocery store manager reveals he just got a new shipment of parsnips in, and Word Girl flies off to retrieve them. Tiny Word Girl fights off Two Brains and his henchmen, Huggy uses the grow ray to return everything to normal, and the villains are all shrunk in turn. This is an episode with a lot of turns and developments, but it manages to execute these in humorous ways so it doesn't feel like plot is just drowning out humor. Need to establish a limit on the grow ray's usage? Have it run on a random vegetable. Need to render the grow ray unusable by the climax? Have the henchmen use it on things they shouldn't. Need to get the grocery store manager to Two Brains' lair to reveal how to get more parsnips? Have him get shrunken down while talking about croutons. Oddly, not a whole lot of the humor or plot relies on tropes you'd expect from size change episodes. There's no looking at the world from a tiny person's perspective, or thing becomes much weaker or stronger after size change. The humor relies more on things like the power being misused, or playing with perspective when Tiny Word Girl makes it look like Huggy is flying on his own. And, of course, there's Two Brains' reactions to things going wrong, topped off when Word Girl shows up for the final battle. Well, you're too late! Huh, that's what you think! No, I mean you're too late, it's already pretty much foiled. I will say that Scoops' presence is... kinda pointless. Him teaching Becky how to be a reporter just gets dropped after he's shrunken. His only jokes are assuming Becky's theory is wrong and more focusing more on the story than anything else around him. And there's really no reason you couldn't have had the manager get captured on his own. It feels like the only reason he's here is to reinforce that Becky has a crush on him. And hey, the show does seem to have struck a decent balance between bringing it up often enough to not feel abrupt and rarely enough to not get annoying, so there's that. Aside from a few overhead shots of places that are done pretty rarely, especially for Two Brains' hideout specifically, that's all that's worth discussing. Here. It's a well-constructed episode that's both busy and coherent, setting it apart from other episodes that aren't as packed with information. Huggy, show him what he's won! An all-expense-paid trip to the moon! Okay, I was kidding earlier about them going to space. How is the show able to afford prizes like this but still never gets more than just the same three contestants every time? Are their parents the producers and this is all a big racket? Has anybody ever told you you have a SERIOUS IMPULSE CONTROL PROBLEM?! A grounded Toby plots to finally outsmart Word Girl while his mom has him get ready to go to the department store. As it happens, Becky and her family are also going there that day, and the two run into each other. Toby reveals he's planned a series of robot attacks based around a series of riddles that Word Girl has to solve. Becky turns into Word Girl and gets the first riddle, though only after the robot that would have given it malfunctions. Word Girl stops a robot at the bank, then returns to the department store. Another malfunction, another riddle, and another attack, this time at a fire station. After taking advantage of her status to recommend a specific pair of shoes to her dad, Word Girl finds Toby at a different part of the store. After a weird bonding moment that even they feel kind of awkward about... Are we... Uh... So, uh... You gonna blow something up, or what? Word Girl is given the wrong riddle, and Toby accidentally gives the answer to the right riddle. Word Girl fights the next robot without us even seeing it, and Claire McAllister emerges from the dressing room to take Toby away. Becky returns to her family, and is given an ugly pair of shoes that were decidedly not the ones she recommended. This was one of the most memorable episodes to me as a kid. While the department store setting feels a bit superfluous in hindsight given the actual action takes place at other locations, it does provide a unique look and feel, not to mention a plausible reason why Becky and Toby would run into each other to begin with. 
Toby's efforts here are clearly an attempt to stroke his ego, prove himself smarter than Word Girl, but this falls hilariously flat thanks to his terrible luck with malfunctions, file a complaint with the Department of Featured Words, Toby, and that his riddles are laughable in how they're either extremely easy or already well known. Though I admit the kids watching may have more trouble with them than a 24 year old who's seen this episode a dozen times. Janelle? That doesn't sound right. Maybe that's a P? I can't believe I can't read my own handwriting. Toby, just stick to robots. You are not cut out to be a low-rent Riddler knockoff. This episode also depicts the relationship between Toby and Word Girl a bit differently. While previous episodes either showed Toby trying to use his position to coerce Word Girl or just ignored the crutch altogether, this episode shows him just trying to have fun with Word Girl, albeit in a literally destructive way, and not trying to force her to go on a date with him. And as shown in that bonding scene, the two are clearly comfortable with each other on some level. Toby even seems to be a bit chummier with Becky than usual. This might just be him wanting to stroke his ego by describing his brilliant plan, but he doesn't really act insulting or dismissive towards her like he usually does. This feels like the first episode written by someone who went, you know, maybe these two getting together would be cute. Toby is overall in top form here, striking a great balance between ego, awkwardness, and anger at failures, which mostly trace back to him. This, uh, mannequin arm has been lying here, uh, just waiting for someone to trip over. Or I, I suppose if you had just a few more th things you wanted to try on. You know, a few more. <laughs> Getting back to the whole department store thing, while the main plot doesn't utilize it in any creative ways until the very end, it does get to shine a bit in the... I think subplot might be a bit of a stretch, actually. The shoe store employee is the flattest and most tired sounding character on the show, and I love it. Let me get my foot measurer. And Becky's cover is preserved by Tim and TJ being occupied with their own shopping. Her excuse for slipping away? Hat Club, which according to Tim, is actually a real thing. Ah, uh, yes. I remember my first Hat Club meeting. Really? The more I think about it, the more fascinated I am about what Hat Club could have entailed for him. Do you think he has, like, a top hat with the entire outside being textured with an old photo of his clubmates? That sounds like something Tim Botsford would own. And then Word Girl takes a break from the plot to talk to her dad about shoes while in disguise. Her awkward acting to hide her identity is at its best here, and Tim silently staring back is perfect. Though I admit I'm baffled about where those ugly shoes came from. While I wish this episode utilized its setting better, I had a great time revisiting it, and there were so many little moments that made me smile. I appreciate how the show tries to keep a bit of variance in its villain's plans, and a botched attempt at brain teasers was perfect for Toby. And also to make Word Girl taste the bitter taste of defeat. I know I used taste twice. Then maybe don't try to make that your catchphrase when your arch enemy slash crush is a ten-year-old English major. You just sneezed and flew ten feet in the air. Really? It felt higher than that. Becky is sick in bed with a cold when she learns that Chuck is robbing the bank. She shows up to stop him, but Chuck easily escapes her, being careful to avoid getting himself sick too. Word Girl intercepts Chuck at the jewelry store, but after he accidentally wraps himself up alongside Word Girl, he gets sneezed on. Later, at home, Chuck realizes he's getting sick and his sense of taste stops working. Infuriated, he decides to buy a giant mechanical nose to prevent anyone else from enjoying sandwiches. And if I can't taste the deli sandwich, then I don't want anyone else to either. Well, that's mature. Word Girl reluctantly shows up to stop Chuck, and they... fight until Huggy shows up with the salami slicer machine Chuck wanted to buy this whole time. Naturally, it's a trap, and Chuck is carted away to house arrest, doomed to eat his mother's horrible soup. This is a basic but fun premise, trying to fight crime while you're sick. Word Girl is easily defeated by Chuck in the first two fights, and the third time, even though Chuck himself is also sick by then, he's only beaten by Huggy laying a trap. Word Girl's sick voice is very distinct and convincing, as is the narrator's at the very end, though Chuck's is too similar to his regular voice in my opinion. I like how Chuck's depiction for most of the episode is split between genuine concern for Word Girl and fear of getting sick himself. He and Word Girl are rather polite to each other for most of the episode. It helps him feel even more personable and endearing, as well as setting up his anger when he does get sick. Wanting to make everyone else feel his pain, he uses the money he stole to buy a giant nose to ruin people's deli orders, even at the cost of the salami slicer he wanted to buy. It's honestly amusing how relatively low stakes this is in the grand scheme of things. I especially love how Chuck's idea was not to get as many people sick as possible, which you'd expect with the giant nose, but to just interfere with people's orders. Either he or the writers didn't think of that, or Chuck has at least some standards and doesn't want people to experience all the pain he's going through. 
There's some other details I really like, such as the fake out at the beginning. Just another carefree sunny afternoon in the park. Oops, wrong script. Or Chuck wielding plastic wrap instead of just food like you'd expect. I am a bit surprised they clearly showed off Word Girl's snot covering Chuck's face. I'd have thought that'd cross a line for grossness. This is also a good episode for Reginald, Tim, and the grocery store manager. Reginald gets to look a bit nicer as he seems to show some sympathy for Word Girl being sick, despite also showing some germophobia. Tim is shown to be putting a lot of effort into helping Becky feel comfortable while she's ill, which is just sweet. And the manager is back on his trying to hire villains thing, but I love one specific line of reasoning he gives here. I couldn't buy all this free publicity. Plus, you've increased earplug sales 120%. You're high. This episode takes advantage of its premise pretty well, willingly downplaying action elements for the sake of comedy centered around being sick and how it impacts one's ability to partake in said action. And seeing everyone showing concern for those who've gotten sick makes this episode lighter and helps reinforce the feel-good side of this show's tone. Any particular reason for this unparalleled treachery? Yes! My cold is so bad that it's wrecked my taste buds. Oh yeah, talk about your cold on live TV. That's the best way to hide this from your mom. 170 mid 180 going twice. Sold the higher number. Right, wait, 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 wait. This episode is just going to be a string of jokes about modern art, isn't it? Becky, Bob, and Violet are attending an art auction with Miss Champlain, and Violet notices something off about the sculpture for sale that night. After the sculpture is sold, it's revealed the seller is the butcher of all people. Certain the butcher is stealing art, Word Girl investigates a warehouse where he's keeping his stuff, but the butcher insists all his works are genuine. The next night, Word Girl gets on stage at the auction and declares the butcher is forging art. However, she's threatened with being arrested for harassment if she can't provide solid proof. The night after that, Word Girl and Huggy use disguises to sneak in, but they're found out and almost arrested. Soon, though, they're able to prove they're right via Huggy eating the sculpture, revealing it to be a fake made of meat. The butcher is promptly arrested instead. I think this might be the least action-oriented episode in the show so far. Even Chucky Sneeze had more action scenes, even if they were deliberately undercut for comedy. Here, we get a 10-second long fight in the warehouse, and then the rest of the episode feels more like a detective thing, the focus being on proving the butcher's guilt. Even at the end, the butcher just gets taken away when he's exposed. He doesn't try to make some final push to escape. The detective approach is different, but I think it pulls it off well. It forces Word Girl to go about fighting the butcher in a different way and put together clues from the sculptures themselves and the people around her. Although it doesn't help that between the villain chosen and the appearance of the sculptures, the twist is extremely obvious. I figured it out very easily, even as a kid watching this for the first time. Oh well. While the Butcher's plan may not fool the audience, it is a pretty clever turn for him to scam people instead of robbing them. And it makes sense that he's capable of creating meat sculptures like these. Heck, if he wanted, he could probably make a decent living just branding himself as the meat artist or something. He also does a surprisingly good job fooling everyone with his words. The only times his speech gives away that he might be duplicitous are when he talks about the beauty of art in a flat tone, and when he accidentally mentions artificial colors and preservatives. I can buy a combination of the city's low intelligence and the butcher's charisma leading him to success. This episode also gives us some fun one-off characters. The auctioneer likes to abruptly switch into the stereotypical auctioneer voice, but even in his regular voice he has some good lines. Now, will that be cash or cash? Perhaps you would have better luck bidding on some of the items available in our vending machine. We also get the extremely serious police commissioner, and I'm surprised it took this long to get a distinct police character. He comes off as properly intimidating, but also channels this into a personal favorite trope of mine, the comically serious. Sergeant Henderson! Yes, sir? Get me a cracker. Yes, sir? If you're like young me and watch this show for the action, this episode is lacking. But if you're like slightly less young me and watch it for the humor and characters, this is a very enjoyable episode. It achieves a distinct feel that I'd love to see them emulate occasionally later on. Oh, and I almost forgot. Miss Champlain is here too. We shall start the bidding at... Eleven dollars! <sighs> $200,000? I hereby withdraw my bid! I think anyone would be lucky to love anything as much as she loves art. Because right now, it's far too easy to make a ridiculous product that makes outlandish claims and get it onto local TV. Granny Mae is selling a spray that purports to make one amazingly strong, as demonstrated with the ability to break yarn that even Word Girl struggles with. As Becky ponders how Granny Mae could be faking the effects, she finds that her dad has become a big fan of the spray. After Tim participates in a demonstration, he's recruited by Granny Mae to become her full-time assistant. Word Girl and Huggy break into Granny Mae's house to investigate how the spray is made, and they discover it is indeed made of random, non-functional ingredients. Word Girl and Huggy are momentarily defeated, but they do discover that Granny Mae was faking her demonstrations via a second, much weaker kind of yarn. Word Girl messes with a huge demonstration in the park by swapping in the wrong yarn, exposing Granny Mae's 
scam when Tim fails to break out of it. Granny Mae tries to fly off in her armor, but... What? Out of gas? <laughs> You know, Swap Meet did well for itself by just skipping the final action scene. You didn't have to have a big chase of the climax if it was just going to end on its own. Okay, first off, am I crazy or did they make Granny Mae skinnier and more flexible in this episode? Her appearance and the way she moves just feel a bit off compared to her earlier appearances, and it's a bit jarring. In retrospect, I think I even felt like this as a kid, though I don't think I could put my finger on why. Anyway, this is another scam episode, but it goes for a different feel. Tim's involvement in particular lends the episode a bit more life. He's just so enthusiastic about the spray, to the point of making extremely bizarre leaps in logic. That's because you've never owned running shoes before. True, but it was the spritzer that made me feel good enough to buy these running shoes. Him becoming Granny Mae's assistant was also a great way to keep him in the episode for longer. He's not only really funny here, but he also lends a bit of personal stakes with Becky seeing how Granny Mae is personally exploiting someone close to her. I think it's a really nice touch how Granny Mae uses her own super strong yarn as part of the scam. It's like she's playing off her past criminal activities. If you use this spritzer, you can stand up against something even Word Girl has troubles with. Of course, this is another example of the trick being extremely obvious if you've seen any other Granny Mae episode, or you're not colorblind, but at least it doesn't try to pretend this is some shocking twist, we're just waiting for the characters to catch up. At this point, I'm just going with the flow with regards to people automatically trusting Granny Mae despite her being a criminal. I'm willing to believe Granny Mae is just charismatic and cunning enough to get people to forget that stuff easily, and without this sort of thing, a lot of episodes, not just for Granny but several other villains, wouldn't really work. Heck, even Becky's mom, the district attorney, remember, gets suckered in. I think my favorite joke in this episode would be at the very beginning, when the narrator comments on how Word Girl and Huggy are just... flying before Granny Mae shows up. Uh, yeah, I think they can see that. Sorry, there just doesn't seem to be a lot going on. I didn't know what else to say. Most of the other jokes revolve around people's reactions to the spray, particularly Tim's, but there's also Granny Mae's concoction inadvertently saving Huggy, and Huggy proceeding to free Word Girl in turn using... a loom. Word Girl's smugness when Granny Mae sees the yarn was swapped out is amazing. You can tell she loves being proven right. This episode is pretty much exactly what you'd expect. Granny Mae scamming people and Word Girl investigating to find the truth. Tim's inclusion ends up making it more distinct than it otherwise would have been. I'm glad the writers know to get side characters involved in the A-plots often enough. Her spritzer is so potent, it turned me into a regular old He-Man! It's not working. They call right now and we'll double the offer and give you a second one free. Dr. Two Brains unveils his newest creation, a robotic mouse suit that allows him to fight toe to toe with Word Girl. He plans to use it to steal enough money to buy himself a private island, as well as get a second one for free thanks to the city's two for one festival. He also decides to fire his henchmen, deciding his suit makes them obsolete. The next day, Becky is introduced to the narrator's dramatic sounding brother before Two Brains breaks into the museum. She tries to fight him as Word Girl, but the mouse suit is indeed strong and it's able to overcome her. Also, Two Brains' henchmen got jobs at the museum. You got away. Um, yes, I can see that. I don't think we'll be needing your services anymore. Two Brains then goes to a pants store to steal. golden pants? Word Girl shows up to fight him again, but gets beaten once more. However, she does find the suit's manual after Two Brains decides he doesn't need it anymore and throws it out. Also, Two Brains' henchmen got jobs at the pants store. You two are fired! Turn in your pants! Word Girl and Huggy analyze the manual, and they find a weakness in the suit. Two Brains arrives at the private island store, just roll with it, and runs into his henchmen once again. But we work here. That's what you think! <laughs> Now, off you go. Shoo, shoo, go. Word Girl arrives and pretends to admit the mouse suit is too powerful for her, but Huggy sneaks up behind Two Brains and activates the aforementioned weakness. That big red self-destruct button just right on your back. You noticed that, did you? Well, it's not the worst place to put a self-destruct button. Two Brains tries to get his henchmen to help, but they're tired of him by this point and just leave. Two Brains is captured, and we say bye to the narrator's brother. This is a bit weird as a Dr. Two Brains episode. This is the first instance of him not aiming to steal cheese, even indirectly. While it does feel a little off, I do love how over the top the goal of wanting his own private island is. <laughs> Every evil scientist has one, it's high time I had one too. The Mega Mouse suit itself is also different from most of his inventions cause, well, it allows him to fight Word Girl more personally than firing ray guns or sticking his henchmen on her. It's a fun concept, though I wish they did a bit more with it. 
The episode's first fight has him use a Limburger stink spray to incapacitate Word Girl and then use the suit's mouse tail to grab a statue. These were fun ways of incorporating Two Brains' theme into the robot more. Beyond that though, he just uses brute force, indestructibility, and a sonic pulse, which all feel really generic. I'd have loved to see more mouse or cheese themed weapons. Stuff like using the whiskers to fight, running super fast on all fours, eating through stuff, even though Dr. Drew Rins can apparently do that last one on his own. The episode used the suit decently well, but I think it could have been a lot more fun if it leaned into his mouse aspects more. Speaking of fun, let's talk about the narrator's brother. Totally unaware of the danger about to descend on the city and on the world. He perpetually sounds like he's doing narration for a movie trailer, and he plays the entire episode very straight. He pairs well with the narrator, who he shares a job with for the episode, and who gets to show off some affectionate and insecure sides we haven't seen before. He also plays well off Word Girl and Huggy, who aren't used to the sort of tone this guy aims for. The brother isn't as much of a character as a narrator, but that comes with the territory of being a disembodied voice who hasn't had time to make a lot of jokes and develop a personality. For the purposes of this episode, playing off the two-for-one festival and the feature word identical, he does well for himself. Oh no, we're identical twins. I am 20 seconds older. Right, got it. And then there's the henchman. Oh, poor henchman. Dr. Two Brains wasn't the best boss up to this point, but he did at least try to negotiate and compromise with them a bit. Here, he gets so overconfident thanks to the Mecha Mouse that he thinks he could go it alone and leave the henchmen in the dust. And when he meets them again, he just reacts with awkwardness, not caring that he repeatedly gets them fired from their new jobs. These guys really need to unionize. Of course, the henchmen are back with Two Brains by their next appearance with no explanation, because this is not a continuity-focused show. But this episode does well with the concept of them getting fired, and it's satisfying to see them reject him at the very end. I honestly feel like this was a subtle power of friendship message. Two Brains' arrogance leads him to forego any help from others, but he's ultimately defeated by Word Girl and Huggy working together. Word Girl does the heavy lifting and distracts Two Brains at the end, while Huggy is the one who finds the manual and actually presses the self-destruct button. And if Two Brains still had his henchmen running support, they might have seen Huggy and stopped him from going for the button. This sort of theme would actually make extra sense given the whole two-for-one thing. It's better to have things together than separate. Aside from that, there's not much to mention aside from how hard the episode goes on the two-for-one concept. It crops up in the background a lot, particularly in the museum sequence, and I can't help but appreciate the attention to detail. But what makes it even better is how it's outright defied at the pants store because... There's a pair of pants right there. I mean, a pair means two. That's it. I want to speak to your manager. This episode uses several unique elements that are reused later very rarely, if at all. An additional narrator, separating Two Brains and the henchmen, Two Brains engaging in more upfront fighting. They help this episode feel distinct, and it definitely manages to not misuse those aspects. What just happened? So you, uh, liked the pants so much you decided not to sell them, huh? So let's talk about something a little less fun for a moment. In the last video, I put in a little addendum noting that Word Girl was being phased out of PBS broadcasts. At the very end of last year, less than two weeks after my video went live, this went through. Specifically, the show was no longer being aired nationally, though to my understanding, individual stations can still choose to air episodes if they want. This was entirely coincidental on my part. I had actually started the original video months before I learned about the show being dropped, but it puts this retrospective in an interesting position. As time goes on, more and more people will have been unable to experience Word Girl through official means. Granted, it's not impossible to do so. You can watch a small pool of select episodes on the PBS website, or use Amazon or YouTube to buy or rent episodes for too much money, but the show is far less accessible now, both for longtime fans and for kids of today who have never seen the show but might get a lot of enjoyment and literacy out of it if they did. So I think people like me, or fan artists, or fanfic writers, or people who post out-of-context compilations are key in putting forward the show when PBS doesn't want to anymore. Maybe this sort of thing will help Word Girl catch on with kids of today, even if only a few. Maybe we're just creating a nostalgic echo chamber where we remember the good times and eagerly chase down what we missed. Whatever the case, I think there's value in keeping the show alive in some form. If you have a cartoon, or a book, or a video game, or a movie, or anything else that you want to keep from falling into obscurity, just talk about it. Share it with anyone who seems interested, and reach out to others who also love it. Next time on... An orange and a tangerine. You forgot my clementine! Oh, I have a good dad, yeah, whatever! I have no idea what you just said. Handsome panda! Or... No 
okay, but only for a minute. Should I take my shoes off? I tied you up using my superpowers. <laughs> We're going Huggy finished setting up the super villain. Super villain? What?